it's good to hear all the fellowship that's going on, and we'll get to do some of that again afterwards. It's one of the benefits of doing something like this. You've had to make some sacrifices, and I, we do recognize that. I actually wasn't going to mention this to the last session, because now I'm going to hear about it, but, but one sacrifice you really made was coffee. And you'll be interested to know that coffee drinking was invented in Turkey. They're the ones that, that they came up with Turkey, or t for coffee. Turkey's the one that invented coffee drinking. And tea drinking is huge. They have tea for every meal, hot tea, in these little glasses. And I really enjoyed that. So that was cool. So, so thanks for making sacrifices to be here all together. But hopefully you've been learning and, and being challenged by our study in the seven churches of Revelation. We want to welcome the high school class today. Thanks for being flexible as Pastor Darrell isn't feeling so well today. So uh, thank you for making that change. And, uh, well, let's just uh, jump in here, but we'll start with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity to gather to study your word in a portion of scripture that really fits in a certain context there in Asia Minor and Turkey, in the modern country of Turkey. And we, we need to understand that background in order to understand what's happening in the scripture so that we can be properly challenged by it. Thank you for your word. and for how you worked in people's lives through the ages, throughout history, and we can learn from them. Today, there's kind of this view that people in the past uh, aren't to be respected or they really didn't know what they, it doesn't really matter what they thought because it's just old. But yet, if we do the same mistakes that they made, that isn't really uh, smart on our part. We should learn from the past. We should learn from from the mistakes that people made and we know that you're the one who can fix our problems and you're the focus of this book it is the revelation of jesus and so thank you for the way you're working in our lives in christ's name we pray amen well we've been we've been going through the book of uh revelation in chapters two and and then we'll be doing chapter three as well when we hit sardis next week but we've been breaking the seal as we go. Remember, it's in a scroll, and there are seals that, that each church had to break in order to read their portion of the scroll. And so we uh, continue to go through those churches. Ephesus was the first church, the chief church, the top church of the seven. And uh, they were the church that uh, uh, all the mail came into Ephesus, and then it was dispersed on the road. So the mail went from... Paul just used the mail route as he talked to the, or I say Paul, I keep doing that once in a while. It's John, the apostle John that wrote to the seven churches, but Ephesus is where the mail comes in, then it went to Smyrna, then Pergamum as we studied last week, and now today Thyatira. And we've been using coins. Coins were billboards to, uh, that the emperors would use to encourage people, and usually they put the emperor's pictures on the coins so that people would... They would have unity in the Roman Empire. Well, we've changed these coins, and we, we made a coin for each church to help us remember what's happening. The first one's Ephesus. Their, their, their problem was they lost their first love. They lost their priority. They didn't have passion for Jesus anymore. They were working really hard as a church, but they had lost their passion for Jesus. So that's their coin, priority number one. And then Smyrna was weighed down with several fears, the fears of persecution, and uh, just the, the fear of just the environment that they were in there. Uh, so Smyrna needed to learn how to trust Jesus in the midst of our fears. And we don't have anxiety, do we, in, in our culture today and in our struggles today. We don't deal with fear, do we? No, we need Jesus to help us calm our fears. And then Pergamum was just exhausted because of all the cults, all the worship around them that was coming in onto the church. And so uh, it would have been easy to give in and just not fight anymore. And they were exhausted. They were tired uh, of these false re religious beliefs, all the uh, false gods of the Romans, as well as the emperor worship. It, as we see in each of these cities, they struggled with the emperor worship and how they needed to put a pinch of incense in the altar every year and then say, Caesar is Lord, as they went by the, the, in the temple. A Domitian, emperor Domitian, was not a good guy. And so... Uh, that was the environment that they lived in. So could Christians compromise? Could Christians actually do that? Or do you do that but say under your breath, Jesus is Lord? Or do you not do it and you resist and then 
you probably would be persecuted or killed for your faith. So these are the environments that the, the Christians were living under. Today we're going to go to Thyatira. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of uh, remains uh, today there at Thyatira, more than Smyrna. Smyrna is kind of like the worst one. But Thyatira is also underneath a modern city, so we can't go in and just tear up people's houses. They kind of frown upon that. So, but we do have some of the, the remains, and I have some other pictures to show you as well of the area there today. But Thyra Tyra's coin is, a mu- is an arm with a muscle, and that is the guilds, uh, the, the unions were strong. This is a blue collar town. Thyra Tyra was hard working, and so they had all of these unions of different things, and we're going to talk about that here uh, today. Um, Basically, let's just now, we'll be working through some of our pictures here, but as I do that, I want to just share this. The city of Thyatira was founded by one of Alexander the Great's successors. Remember, Alexander the Great had conquered the known world at one point by a young age, and whenever that, when he was done conquering, he was depressed, he, he resorted to alcohol, and basically we think he may have died from alcoholism or something else. There's different theories on how he died, but basically... Once you conquer the known world, there's nothing else to do. So it's unfortunate that, that, you know, this man got to that place. But then there was, he was so young and his son wasn't old enough to take over. So then there's the four generals that take over. And one of those generals, say Lucas, is the one who takes over this area of the Roman Empire. And so Thyatira was founded by Seleucus, or say Lucas. The city is on a low plateau surrounded by a gently sloping sloping valley. Um, So kind of a plain, a farming plain. Uh, A lot of these towns are in farming areas. So when you're driving along, you just see beautiful country. And uh, you you kind of think of the cove. It's a little different. They they don't have the corn as much as we do, but they, you know, we have uh, wheat fields and just different crops that they grow there. And of course, we were there in the winter time, so I'm not sure all of what crops they they grow there as the fields were, you know, the crops weren't on the fields at that point. But just kind of have that picture in your mind. It was a border or a garrison town that protected Pergamum. So Pergamum last week was this amazing city on top of this mountain, and it was kind of the capital of the region. And Thyatira is this blue-collar town, and whenever other people tried to attack and to go to war with them, they would come through Thyatira on the road first before they come to Pergamum. So they realized we will have our garrison, we'll have our military guys at Thyatira so they can fight there before they come to Pergamum. So Thyatira was exposed and, and, and because of the circumstance with the military guys that could be there, they could march to Pergamum within about a day or so. Uh, So that's the situation of this city. Uh, Thyatira was struck by an earthquake in 17 BC, and this earthquake is going to come up now in our different cities. Philadelphia got decimated by the earthquake in 17 BC. Sardis, that we're going to talk about next week, got really hit hard by the earthquake. Uh, It was one of the most massive earthquakes in in ancient times, from what we understand. And the church... uh, the church was about 40 years old when John wrote his letter to Thyatira. So the, this city had to recover from this earthquake. The Roman Empire usually would come in and help the towns recover, but some towns got more help than others. And Philadelphia, that we'll talk about in two weeks, they didn't get much help at all. So they were really in a bad situation. There were ruins from the, from the third to fourth century. There's ruins of a church. This is not a Roman building. This was... Uh, during the Byzantine time, which I guess is kind of the Roman Empire too. But you have the Romans, and then at, when the Byzantines take over, the Constantine is the emperor, and he takes over, and he proclaims Christianity as the religion. It's the authorized religion. And so then you have the Byzantine period. So churches crop up everywhere, because now uh, Christianity isn't persecuted like it had been. And so we have a lot of these Byzantine churches, and this is kind of a when you see that type of structure, you, you know it's a Byzantine church because you see that at different places. And we'll see that in our journeys as we continually go. Um, 
Our theme for today is spiritual complacency invites unrestricted moral compromise. And this is Dr. Randy Smith's stuff. I take a lot of his stuff. Uh, he was really a great teacher for us. And he will be our, I know we're planning this trip to Israel. And some of you have already said you want to sign up, which is really exciting. We can take 53 people in uh, May of 2024 to Israel. And uh, Dr. Randy Smith will be our teacher. But he has been really helpful in in providing all this information to us as we went with him in Turkey. But this was his title for Thyatira. Spiritual complacency invites unrestricted moral compromise. Um, we know that Thyatira was a union town because the cemeteries give that indication. There were union marks for each of the different unions that people were part of. Uh, everybody had a different trade and then they were part of that union. There were smelting there where they would... Uh, uh, metal, they would uh, melt metal and so forth. There was also the textile industry because of all the farms. Uh, so there's a lot of, uh, a lot of these cities have wool or textiles. They make carpets, the Turkey, the famous uh, ancient Tur Turkish carpets that you can see today. They still make the handmade carpets today. I'm going to show you some of those here in just a few minutes. The entire social industry and even the religious structure centered around the unions or the guilds. So think of the Mandalorian if you like that. So being part of the guild, okay? That might be a stretch, but that was kind of a little bit of a joke, but it didn't really work too well, but that's okay. <laughs> that happens to Pastor Daryl sometimes too. So. <laughs> He's not here to defend himself. So. Um, there were religious unions and trades, trade guilds throughout the entire Roman Empire. So this isn't just in Thyatira, but Thyatira had tons of guilds. And here were some of the guilds. There were weavers, uh, dyers, bakers, potters, shoemakers, doctors, teachers, painters, flute players, bronze smiths, tanners, and others. So whatever your job was, you were part of that union. And it was, uh, it was a culturally impressive city. Don't have this idea that it's just a hick town. There was a lot of culture as well in the city, even though it's also very blue collar, hardworking. Um, Think of FedEx and UPS setting up shop here because they're on the trade route. So you have all this industry that's happening there by the blue collar workers and then they ship all of their things out, out and beyond. So uh, think of that type of an idea. So this is a wealthy town because of all of what they, they do. We see evidence of lots of temples here. And remember temples, we think religious temples. Think cultic temples and think money. Think banks. And even the temples, even in, in Judaism, uh, the temples also had banks. That's where you got your paycheck. So the unions were part of a temple, a specific temple. So everything's melded together. Your religion, your job, everything's under your union. And that's where you got your paycheck. And so that's important to understand. Now I want to look at some pictures here of some things. There's a small museum at Thyatira there that you can go into. And so here's just some of the pottery that they found from the site. So uh, just kind of gives you some idea of some of the things that could be made there. Uh, also, uh, next we have these religious figurines. People had different gods that they revered. So you would have your little, little figurine of your god. So, you know, the Christians didn't have an idol of Jesus. They, they worship the living God. So that would have been odd to everyone. Everyone else had their little figurine of their God. So when Christians would be against that, that would be socially taboo for Christians to do that. They were called atheists because they didn't have their little gods, their little figurines. And then you see some lamps from ancient times that they found there as well as some pottery, uh, some pictures of pottery as well. So here's, my, here's the point of all that cultural background. If you declared yourself a Christian in this town, you would have to defy your union or your guild that you were a part of. Because in order to do everything that the guild wanted you to do would mean that you would have to compromise your faith. That means that Thyatira was probably one of the smallest of the seven churches of people. Remember, the churches were the people. And Philadelphia is probably the smallest, but both, both Thyatira and Philadelphia were small churches. Christians face economic difficulties and social isolation for not being part of the guild. So if you came to Christ, you had to leave your guild 
because you have to understand the guilds were involved with pagan worship. They were also were involved with sexual immorality that occurred in your guild, in your parties that you had when you, 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 all of the people in your work got together and had parties, and they were pagan. So if you were a Christian, you can't go to that. Well, if you don't go to that, people are going to, why didn't you come to the party? You're part of the guild. And the guild was seen as something that unified everybody. So if you were against the guild, then you were really against the Roman Empire, and you weren't, you weren't a good citizen. And your whole family was frowned upon because of this. So can you imagine living in that type of environment? It would be really, really difficult. Christians... Uh, just really faced a lot of problems and one of those problems was the god of Apollo and sometimes they would mix their gods they would take the Greek gods and then they became the Roman gods and then they had gods from other things and they would they did syncretism where they put gods together but the main one of the main gods was Apollo Christians uh, would have been really repulsed by the sun god Apollo uh, it's interesting that by the way you we know the word Apollo because of NASA and the Apollo missions when they went to the moon. The reason the word Apollo was used, and, uh, and he's, the moon, he's the sun god, not the moon god. Artemis is the moon god, so they're going to name the next mission Artemis, as I mentioned a couple weeks ago. But why did they use Apollo? Well, the director of NASA at the time in 1960 was reading Greek mythology, and so he thought it was really cool that Apollo was in the sky, and he was blazing in like this chariot in the sky, and so he thought we should just use that as our terminology for the, the moon project here in NASA. So we're really impacted by the, our past history and culture. Apollo is the god of archery, music, dance, truth, prophecy, healing, diseases, light, poetry, and more. So he covers a lot of ground. And if people didn't worship Apollo, uh, they would be removed from their guild. So if you're a Christian, you can't worship him. So that meant you didn't get your paycheck. So think about that. If you can't be a part of the guild, you can't get your paycheck. So that's a really tough situation. It's one thing for Christians not to worship in the cultic temples as we saw last week in Pergamum. It's a whole nother deal that you would lose your job and your paycheck if you were a Christian. Would you be willing to give up your job and your paycheck to be a Christian? It's easy for us to say, oh, yes, we would. But could you imagine that? How difficult that would be. I also have to just mention this, and this is another attempt at a joke that probably won't be funny, but there is a goddess named Nike, Nike the, god, the goddess of victory. So I'm assuming that was the shoe guild god, the Nike, Nike god. So I don't know if that's true or not, but... Well, we, we, we realized the church at Thyatira was passionate about their faith in God, but they were compromising. The scripture talks about that. They were really passionate about Jesus for those that, that small church, those that were willing to give up their guilds. But they were compromising. They were under pressure to compromise, and the trade guilds caused that compromise. The guilds weren't wholesome. They had organized crime. Uh, they pushed certain political candidates for gover government that you had to support. What if you disagreed with the candidates that were being proposed by the guild? And I'm sure they didn't approve of the emperors either because they were ungodly. The unions had requirements for meetings and regulations. They had cultic practices. And you couldn't even have your body buried after you died in the cemetery without being part of the guild. So if you gave up the guild, you didn't even know if your body was going to be buried when you died. That's the situation that the Christians were under. We should talk about a famous Christian from Thyatira. Her name is Lydia. We know that she is reached by Paul in a different city in, in, in um, uh, Philippi. She's across the Aegean Sea selling her fabric that's famous from Thyatira. She's the seller of purple, the purple dye that was very famous from Thyatira. And we know that Paul... Uh, Paul's ministry probably from Ephesus, because he was there for several years, probably also impacted the church at Thyatira as well. So they would have been familiar with who Paul was. But Lydia comes to Christ, and we want to read of her conversion here and of her situation in Acts 16, verses 14 through 15. It says this, 
one who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized in her household as well, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. So we, we theorize that Lydia was probably a wealthy um, person because of being the seller of purple, the color of royalty. And she has this big house. She's able to have all of the people in. And yet we also wonder too, if she can't be part of her guild, is it possible that that's one of the reasons why she left Thyatira? She's from Thyatira. She has her trade from Thyatira, but she's in Philippi. Could it be that that was an easy way to deal with the pressures of the guild so you can just be in another town selling your goods? We don't really know. We're theorizing. The textile industry was really big in this area, and they used the, the Murex snails that had different colors in the different regions. And you see snails everywhere. Every site we would go to, you look down and you'd see snails. And they take these snails and they take the dye out of them. And, and like a thimble size of dye, it takes like thousands and thousands of snails to just get a very small quantity of dye. And there's different colors of purples, blues, and reds from these snails. And each of the different regions had different colors. And so we understand here that they actually imported the dyes from the region, from the area, into Thyatira to make their fabrics. Also, um, another thing that they used was the mater root, a plant that had a reddish scarlet dye. So when it talks about Lydia being the seller of purple, her purple wasn't as purple as you might think. It was more of a purplish reddish color like this. And that was very special uh, special dye that they would use. Royal blue, you hear the color of royal blue. That would have been also from like another snail. You have different colors that come and all of these colors are very special and reserved for royalty. Um, so I wanna just show you a little bit now about, we went to a, a carpet factory today that, that makes handmade Turkish carpets. They still are doing this today and this is the region where they did it at, in ancient times and it's it's pretty amazing how they they do this by hand so I'm going to show you a little bit here what the, uh, the lady here is tying one thread on she's looking at this pattern up here and then she is actually taking the color wherever she's at in the pattern and then she's putting it onto the carpet and then these are the different threads that they make uh, with the different dyes and it's pretty amazing here this is probably a better picture you can see here she's making the carpet down here she's looking at the pattern up here to find out what thread she needs to do and they move really fast and I don't know how they don't hurt their wrists and it is insane um, and also if you want to buy a carpet because they take you there and then they they want you to buy carpets and you think well that would be kind of nice and then when you find out they're thousands of dollars you're like I don't think that's that nice anymore. Like, there, I, I think that's nice for you to have that, and I th think I'm buying a $5,000 carpet to have sent home. I'm not sure that I could, could afford that, so. But can we take it back to the other picture here? This is the, 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 the bug or the worm. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what it is, but it's a, silk, a silkworm that would, would make a cocoon, and they have to harvest these cocoons, and they found that the best time to harvest them is like there's only certain times when the, the silk is at the very best but to make the very best carpets the silk carpets they have these silkworms and then they pull these threads off of these cocoons with this little fork like thing and she has it pulled up there and those little cocoons are like miles of silk like three three miles four miles of silk from one of the little cocoons and then they thread that together to make the silk threads. They still do it the way they did in ancient times. So it's pretty amazing. So we can keep going here. And here's just some of the different carpets that we saw. I need to show you uh, some of these really famous. I always picked out the most expensive carpets. F for my house, I kind of like this because I have more earth tones. So I thought that one was kind of cool. And then, uh, yeah, I got to show you the ones. I always pick out the most expensive ones. I, I don't know how this works, but uh, let's look at the, uh, the next one. This one is the one that's in the White House, which I thought was really cool. It'd just be cool to have a reproduction from the, from the White House, but you don't want to know what these carpets cost, by the way. 
But this was my favorite one. This one has 24 colors of blue in it, and I discovered it six figures. That's what it cost. I decided I didn't need that carpet anymore after that. So, But isn't that amazing? Amazing that that's done by hand and to all the different use of colors and they use those dyes from the uh, different uh, in the environment there with the snails and things and I'm sure today they probably use different types of dyes for their carpets but just really amazing uh, just a small small carpet was like three four thousand dollars so these things were like I said just unbelievably expensive but it, take, it took the lady, that picture where I showed you the lady baking the carpet, it would take her nine months to complete one carpet. So can you imagine? That's why it's so expensive. Someone works eight hours a day for nine months to make a carpet. It, it, that's going to add up on the price. So here with all of this background of Thyatira, let's now look at the text today in Revelation 2, 18 through 29. And this is our longest passage of the seven churches. So I have it on two different slides here. But let's just read this together. I'm going to read from my notes because I have a couple of notes here. But this is what it says. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, the words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. And that term bronze, or brass, it would have been really, uh, you know, you're thinking about the metal urges here of the, of the uh, different guilds. The metal guilds, they would have related well to that, that phrase. So John uses the culture as he talks. Verse 19, I know your works, your love, your faith and service and patient endurance in the midst of all this mess with the guilds, that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols which that's what was happening in the, in the guilds. Behold, I will throw her on to a sick bed, and it's most likely the dining couches that would have been at the guilds, and I'll explain that later, what that is. And those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into great tribulation, and there's our word, uh, tribulum, which was that device that had teeth on it that they used to drag over the grain to get the halls and the and the husk off, the chaff off the grain to separate, and then was later used as a torture device, that's the same word, or affliction. So I will throw them into great tribulation unless they repent of her works. So there's this false prophetess, Jezebel, and we're going to talk about her in just a few minutes, and she was leading people astray. Verse 23, and I will strike her children dead, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to his works. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold to this teaching, so there were some that were faithful, who have not learned what some called the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. So there were some in this church who were truly faithful, and we, that, that is amazing in the environment that they were in. Verse 25, only hold fast what you have until you come. The one who conquers and who keeps my words until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron. There again, it's the metal references. And when earthen pots are broken into pieces, even I myself have received authority from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So as we see here, the church had allowed the world to impact them greatly, and Jesus is condemning of them for doing that and yet wow what a difficult situation but he does give them some positive comments so these are the positive conclusions that Jesus made Jesus said he knew the church worked hard well that's not surprising in a blue-collar church they knew how to work hard but they had moral compromise and that was a problem they also had a heart and passion unlike Ephesus it was kind of the opposite of Ephesus they still had their passion for Jesus well well, that makes sense. Anybody who's willing to still stand for Christ in that type of an environment, you've got to have some passion for Jesus to do that. Unfortunately, this big problem of the prophetess Jezebel comes up. We're not really sure what her real name is. It, it probably wasn't her real name. It, the word Jezebel incites us back to Old Testament times because there was 
the wife of King Ahab, a compromising Israeli king, had a wife who did not follow God. She worshipped Baal. She was actually related to um, the, one of the family members that one of the prophetesses of, of Baal. And so um, she wasn't a good woman. She desired to kill the prophets of God, as we see in the Old Testament. She was immoral, caused Ahab to turn away to false gods and to worship Baal himself. Uh, Baal was the god of fertility, of the crops, of the green. So uh, it was believed that Baal grew everything and all the agricultural stuff. So you have the Israelites were the god. They, they, the, those that were against Israel believed that Israel had a god of the desert. Their god could take care of them in the desert for 40 years. But our god, Baal, he's the god of fertility. And he can take care of us here. Jezebel tolerated the worship of idols and sexual immorality. And that was what was happening in those guilds. You know that Ahab uh, built temples to Jezebel to a false god as well. He compromised so much. And she received her judgment when she died. It says, the scripture says in 1 Kings 16 and 2 Kings 9, talk about Jezebel. It says that her bones were gnawed by dogs. Not a good way to go out of this world. So, um, just not a good lady, and she really received her judgment. So this false prophet of Jezebel was tolerating these things in the church, and she was um, prophesizing to the Christians there that they could live a loose life. She basically said that the spiritual is good, the physical is bad, so because the physical is bad, it doesn't matter what you do with the physical. That sounds like Gnosticism that we see in the early church as well. So her belief was somewhat a form of of like Gnosticism. It says that Jezebel was thrown on a bed. This was most likely one of the dining couches that would have been in the, in the guilds. They used these dining couches during celebration dinners where immoral acts were committed. And that's all I'm going to mention at this point. But it's just complete what we would call, I guess, debauchery in these guilds. Just a bad deal. The translators use the word sickness here on a bed of sickness, but that, the word sickness is not in the original text. It actually should be stronger. She basically is going to die um, and get judgment, and it says her children will die as well. So that meant her followers. Anyone that followed this false prophet of Jezebel was going to be judged because they weren't Christians. They weren't true Christians. They had compromised. The sin of Jezebel was either sensuality or compromising their distinctiveness as a believer. I would say it was both. There's definitely both going on there. Jezebel taught what was evil was good, and she didn't follow the word of God. So the church was really impacted by this false prophet, and they had been tolerating her. So Jesus really confronts that. But still, Jesus is in churches even when there's compromise. He still finds those who are faithful, and he still works with those who are faithful. And we know there were several that were still faithful. And Jesus is mentioned here as being the Son of God. It's the only title, the only time the title Son of God is mentioned in Revelation. So that's really special here. And then Jesus sees uh, with these laser eyes, this idea of, of his fire eyes, He's able to discern the hearts. Hebrews 4.13 says, And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So Jesus sees. He sees when you're faithful in the midst of a pagan culture. He knows that you're faithful. He knows if you're not faithful. He sees. And we're never alone. Jesus is always with us. It says that he has the feet of bronze. And this is the idea that he will tramp out impurity and the idea of the impurities out of metal, kind of that idea. So Jesus is the one who, he has to tramp on us sometimes to get those impurities out of us. And he gives us that accountability. We need accountability of Jesus and others in the church to help us not to compromise in a, in a world that does compromise. I wanted to just share with you this quote by Diedrich Bonhoeffer that was really powerful. Uh, listen to this about temptation. In our members, there is a slumbering in inclination towards desire, 
which is both sudden and fierce. And we all struggle with this, with temptation. With irresistible power, desire sees mastery of the flesh. All at once a secret smoldering fire is kindled. The flesh burns and is in flames. It makes no difference whether it's a sexual desire, ambition, or vanity, or desire for revenge, our love for fame and power, or money and greed. At this moment, God is quite unreal to us. You get that? In those moments, God becomes unreal to us. We lie to ourselves and say God isn't really there. He loses all reality and only desires for the creature is real. Satan does not here fill us with hatred for God, but with forgetfulness of God. When we struggle with temptation to sin, we just forget God. We just forget Jesus. We forget that he's with us. The lustless arouses, envelops the mind, and, will, and the will of man in deepest darkness. The powers of clear discrimination and of decision are taken from us. We can't think rationally when we're tempted by sin and we, we begin to fall into those traps. The questions present themselves. Is what the flesh desires really sin in this case? So we justify our actions. And is it really not permitted me? Yes, expected of me now here in my particular situation to appease the desire. You know, I want to be happy. I want to have fun, and it's okay. We justify those sinful actions. It is here that everything within me rises up against the word of God. Therefore, the Bible teaches us in times of temptation in the flesh, there's one command, flee, flee fornication, flee adultery, flee youthful lust, flee the lust of the world. There is no resistance to Satan in lust other than flight. We need to run when we're tempted with sin. Every struggle against lust in one's own strength is doomed to failure. If we don't run when we're tempted, we're going to be doomed. Dr. Randy Smith puts it this way. The Bible says we should resist the devil, but we flee temptation. Don't try to fight temptation. We have to run from it. And we need other Christians to help us to run in those moments when we're weak. So for those Christians in Thyatira, to flee temptation meant quite a sacrifice. They had to give up their incomes, their jobs, and their social status. Would you be willing to do that? Christians who were members of the guild at Thyatira wanted their cake and they wanted to eat it too. They wanted to compromise and still be a Christian, but you can't be a Christian and compromise. We can't compromise our morals, our sexuality, and our faith. And just another word that Randy Smith had pointed out that I thought was also really good. Love today means, we're being told today that Christians need to love everyone. We need to love everyone and tolerate everyone. And we need to respect everyone that has different opinions about things. But love means that we're to tolerate even if they practice immor immoral behavior. And tolerating sin is not love at all. It is condoning their sin which is hurting them, especially their eternal harm. We can't just tolerate. But before we start pointing fingers at other people, <laughs> what are we dealing with? What sins are we dealing with that we are tolerating, that we need to deal with? We're called to be holy and pure in an unholy and pure world. We can't have Jesus and the world too. We have to, we have to make a choice. Do we want to fit into the world or do we want to stand out for Christ? We need to have a backbone. And that's the challenge of Thyatira. Here's the key for Christians in a pagan world with temptation all around us. This is where the rubber meets the road. It was one thing to talk about Thyatira and all their struggles, but uh-oh, we have the same issues in modern America today, don't we? With all the temptations around us and struggles around us, the compromises around us. If we stay faithful to the truth of God's word and don't compromise morally, we don't have to worry about the world encroaching in on us. We're really worried about the world encroaching in on us. Instead of worrying about that, maybe we should be concerned about our own spirituality. Where are we at with Jesus? If we're committed to Jesus, we will start to make the impact out the other way. The world, the church can't compromise and become like the world. We still have authority over the world. Revelation 2.26 says that. Basically, that verse is saying Jesus wins. He's going to make everything that's wrong about this world right. He is going to restore it. Now, we, wanna, we want it to happen now. 
We cannot understand why God would allow an 18-year-old young man to go in and shoot innocent children in elementary school. That makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. But Satan is working. And one of my explanations is Satan was definitely there working in that situation. But Jesus is going to restore this world. He's going to make it right again. But he is very patient. He's waiting for people to come to Christ. But how long, how many more messages are we going to need to see of all the negativity around us before we really get this message that Jesus will win and he will restore? We will prevail as Christians. We are given the rod of iron and dash pottery, it says. So here he's talking to the union people with the iron and the pottery workers so they could relate to this. The promise is that Christians will eventually prevail in the future. We will not be under the demission of earthly, sinful rulers anymore. This is taken also from a messianic promise from Psalm 2, 7 through 9. This idea of the rod of iron dashing pottery. It's referring to Jesus and his millennial kingdom where he makes everything right again. That's what's going to happen. We win because of Jesus. Revelation 2.28 says, We are given the morning star. That's a reference to Jesus. Jesus is our hope. He is our God. He is our purpose for life. Revelation 22.16 also talks about the morning star. Jesus says this, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. It all comes back down to our heart issues. We keep using this term heart issues in all the churches, but we need to examine our heart. Where is our heart with Jesus? The church at Thyatira needed a jolt in their heart. They needed a defibrillator spiritually. They were in trouble because they had compromised. They became lax spiritually and morally. Here's how we can provide defibrillation to our spiritual hearts. First off, know that Jesus knows. Jesus knows what you're going through. He knows what you're dealing with. He knows all about what happened in this country this week. He knows everything that's happening. He is not surprised by it. And he is accomplishing a greater purpose in all of these things. We simply need to follow Christ's standards that we see in his word. We need to hold on to his word. We need to hold on. Hold on in the fight. Sometimes we just have to hold on. And then we choose Jesus and not the world. Be careful about the choices that you make. Don't compromise morally. Remember to trust Christ instead. Are your decisions selfish or are they what would God desire? And then finally, allow the Holy Spirit to grow our faith. Remember, we have the Holy Spirit to help us. When we can't do the spiritual life, we have the Holy Spirit who comes and helps us. He's our helper, as we talked about last week in the Sunday morning service. And then remember that we're on the winning side. Let me ask you this question. Is there a sin in your life you have grown to tolerate which needs to be confessed? Do you need to confess it not only to God but to someone else? It's one thing to say, I'll confess it to God. But boy, when it's private and we just confess it to God, <laughs> it's easy to compromise. But if you tell it to someone else, then they know and they can help you win that battle. And that's really hard to do, but that will help us overcome those sins and the church of Thyatira needed to stick together so they did not compromise the scripture says he who has an ear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches we're to be wise if we listen to this message of this letter and I just close with this verse Romans 12 9 says this let love be genuine abhor what is evil hold fast to what is good okay do you feel beat up today <laughs> Nobody wants to hear the message of Thyatira. This one's really tough. <laughs> but be encouraged. Jesus wins. And we are on the winning side. And when we compromise, we do experience forgiveness when we go to him as well. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this opportunity to be in your word today. Boy, the Christians at Thyatira who were faithful really challenge our socks off. How were they able to do that in that type of an environment? They are our example. Help us to be that example in this world of compromise as well. Thank you for this time in your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And we just have one announcement to say to you. Uh, make sure you pick up your kids, by the way. 
before worship here in about 25 minutes. But I'm supposed to ask you to raise your hand if you're a volunteer in the kids' ministry or if you're a volunteer in the youth ministry or the worship team or a greeter or an usher. Many hands should be going up right now. Boy, we have no volunteers right now. We have a lot of volunteers, okay? Well, starting, starting in August, we will be scheduling volunteers using a new program, and it's app-based. And so a lot of churches are using this. We're kind of behind the the eight ball on this we're kind of we're really behind the times but this app really helps us coordinate all of the schedules so if someone's scheduled for the worship team they can't be scheduled for the nursery if they're scheduled for children's ministry they're not scheduled as you know over here and so it coordinates everyone's schedules together also this church central app will help us get to know each other better we'll be able to put our photos on there so instead of having the traditional photo directory that you have to come in and take photos and do all of that. Nobody wants to buy pictures that are horribly expensive, but you'll be able to use the app and you'll be able to get to know other people in the church that way. So we're really hoping to get that set up. But the only way it's going to work is if people sign up. And if you have problems with some of the technology, we have the Geek Squad back. We have our own Martinsburg GBC Geek Squad back in the lobby today. You can go back there and they can help you get the app set up on your phone. So... Um, yeah, we want to encourage you to do that. Some of you can go online and do that. You don't have to do it on your phone. You can do it, I think, on, online as well. So you are dismissed. And take a break here for the next 20 minutes. And we'll see you back at 1015.